Well, the initial idea for the restatement of the law of the American Indian was um, to try to encapsulate what I called, um, borrowing from another, another judge, uh, low-hanging fruit in federal Indian law. And the field is incredibly complex. And there are so many cases that come down to a long history of a very small parcel of land and a very small group of people that it was um, important to try and parse out some broader principles. Luckily, we have um, sort of a built-in uh, structure based on the three, what, what thank, uh, Justice O'Connor actually called the three levels of sovereignty. There's the federal government, there are state governments, and it turns out there are tribal governments as well. There's constant interaction between those three sovereigns that generate controversies that end up in court what court has jurisdiction to decide a transaction that's gone wrong on an Indian reservation when the parties have attempted to waive certain um, uh, procedures um, or attempted to define a venue for the resolution of that dispute. Um, is that an authorized uh, relinquishment of tribal sovereign power? Is it not? So we started thinking about how uh, a project that would um, be able to restate some of these broader rules and principles would be structured and it seemed like so much of um, federal Indian law starts with Congress, starts with the United States and the executive branch. So um, really as a shorthand we said that's chapter one. I'll be responsible for um, developing chapter two which focuses on the powers of Indian tribes and so uh, it's going to uh, cover for example many of the inherent um, uh, powers of uh, tribes which exercise inherent sovereignty. So it's going to address, for example, some of the specifically enumerated powers that have been described in former um, opinions of the solicitor and cited in federal court case law, um, such as uh, the duty to determine what form of government um, tribes will develop and not the duty, but rather the power to determine that, and also um, the power to determine the criteria for membership in the tribe, um, and also to legislate with respect to a wide variety of matters. And Chapter 4 is going to address um, uh, two aspects of economic development in Indian country, um, tribes as economic actors and tribes as economic regulators. So tribes and their enterprises engage in um, these activities in both of those forms. I should say that tribal enterprises are really the actors and sometimes tribes themselves are the actors, um, but tribes are also regulators. Our hope is that uh, we will have a succinct um, group of principles that address tribes as economic actors and a succinct set of principles that guide tribes as economic regulators. Um, and those will be well set out and will explain the law in a very crisp way um, so that when the courts are grappling with controversies that arise in these areas or practitioners are um, engaged in these areas, they'll have guidance. I do think people are very interested in the fact that, um, that uh, Indian law is going to be more accessible um, for uh, practitioners who don't specialize in this area. And so we're, I think there's a lot of support for developing this as a product that will increase um, the bar's understanding and knowledge and ability to correctly identify appropriate uh, case law uh, and cite a correctly doctrine in, from Indian law. And so um, we're very much in support and you know, excited about the ability to sort of educate the bar regarding this area of law.